Welcome to Off the Clock, the webcast of employment attorneys at Miller Johnson, where we discuss what is happening in the HR world and provide practical insight and advice. This is Rebecca Strauss with Off the Clock, and today I am so excited, truly excited, to have one of my friends and colleagues, Mike Stroster, joining me for this special live episode. Hi, Mike. Hey, good morning. Good morning. If there is anyone that can make this topic exciting for a <laughs> Wednesday morning <laughs> and fun, it is you. W- w- way to manage everyone's expectations. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you humming along and dancing along that whole music while folks were saying, yeah, I saw it. I saw it. All right. So so why are we doing this live? Why is Mike with us? Why, why did everyone join us today to talk about I-9s? Unfortunately, Uh, We are going to have to travel back in time a little bit uh, to COVID days, right? When uh, there were stay-at-home work orders and all of that, and the landscape for I-9s really changed the way that HR departments uh, processed I-9s. As we know, in in many different contexts, uh, things are starting to, the return to normal is the phrase that is irritating the heck out of me lately, but that's the thing we keep hearing, right? Mike, return to normal, return to normal. And so we're emerging from these COVID-19 rules, uh, specifically as they relate to I-9s. So we need to figure out what the change is, what the deadlines are, And yes, we will answer the question that everyone has, how do we deal with remote workers who have always been remote and will always be remote, right? We're not gonna, we're gonna get into the background first, but for those of you where that is your question and that's probably 99% of you, (laughs) we are going to uh, answer that for you as well as other questions many of you asked prior to this episode. Mike, what happened with COVID-19 <laughs> that changed the I-9 process for everyone? Well, what happened recently is the Department of Homeland Security announced that it is um, ending the what they call the I-9 flexibilities rules. And uh, I'll tell you just as a starting point, the fact that these rules were ever implemented in the first place was amazing enough. The fact that they've continued this long is is frankly, shocking. This is not an agency that is uh, necessarily nimble or otherwise um, flexible, I guess, uh, with with how uh, it enforces its rules and what it uh, imposes on employers. So in any event, uh, early in, in the pandemic, it announced these flexibility rules that allowed employers who have remote workers to uh, review the documents necessary to complete the I-9 remotely. And that was a huge change at the time. Frankly, it's it's been a a huge help to many, many of our our clients, um, both for COVID related reasons and uh, because uh, of the massive increase in in remote work, but it's not limited to COVID related uh, reasons. It was limited though to remote related work, I, I'm afraid that probably a lot of employers got that part wrong, meaning they weren't permitted to review documents remotely for everyone. Rather, they were only permitted to review documents remotely for those who were working remotely and would not otherwise report to uh, the central office that 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 they called it. And so in any event, they finally now announced that the, that remote uh, flexibility is going to end that leaves us with two very important deadlines that we need to keep our uh, our eyes on. The first is by July 31st, we need to go back to the original rule, meaning all documents need to be viewed in their original format live in person. That starts July 31st. Let's just pause that for a moment. So, because yeah. that's big news and this may be news for folks. Uh, listening and watching today. So by July 31st, HR departments have to view the physical documents for new hires. Correct. Okay. Same old rules, right back to the way that that it used to be. Okay. Then, and I'm not suggesting waiting at all, uh, but the second deadline is August 30th. We have to now have updated all of the forms that we uh, completed remotely during 
during this entire period. So by August 30th, uh, employers need to view live and in-person the original documentation that the employee provided to complete the I-9 and uh, note that that process has been done right on the I-9. So that is the, the critical deadline uh, because we're going to be making some notes. I'll talk exactly about what it is you have to do, but um, it, it's important that we start thinking now, if, if you haven't already started thinking about how are we going to do it? Because you, your your issue could be you have a dozen people that you need to track down and get this done for, which is manageable. Or you could be the unfortunate client that I uh, emailed this morning that has 500 um, people that they need to to do this for. So if folks were to do one thing after listening today, just one, and hopefully they're going to do more than one. Right. But it's figure out your resources. Right. And again, we're going to go through some details about what yeah. you actually have to do. But if there is one takeaway that you need to take to your leader, to your C-suite, whatever, think about how much time this will take to accomplish. Right. And make right. sure you have the resources in place uh, to so, get this done by <clears throat> deadlines. Right. So I, I didn't think, although we we had a million different things to do during the pandemic and uh, at the beginning and certainly as it went on. I, I don't think the instructions on this flexibility were, were done very well. And so it is entirely possible that um, uh, employers applied this rule to all of their new hires uh, over the yeah. last three years. And if that's the case, I, I think there's some things we can do to uh, to to fix that. The, it may be that employers thought that once they did it remotely, they were done like you are with most I-9s and you never go and look at them again. And then that's not the case. So part of the upfront process here is to get our arms around exactly what kind of uh, the scope of, of the problem that we're dealing with, right? We have to figure out how many new hires uh, we had and, and how many took advantage of these uh, flexibility rules. Then we're going to be able to figure out what the best strategy is to, to deal with getting them up, up to date. Let's talk about the new hire issue from this point going forward. Right. Just the new hire issue for folks that have grown comfortable uh, viewing on the process for viewing documents remotely. Frankly, there are newer HR professionals sure. uh, listening and watching Mike that have never done it any other way. So let's talk about particularly for workers uh, who are remote. And when we say remote, let's talk about what we're what we're talking, if you could help us break that down. Sure. Does that count, does that include in town, but just not reporting to any physical work site? Or does it mean uh, not physically located near? For the um, flexibility rules, it meant anybody who wasn't reporting to the central office. Okay. However, you might define what the central office is. So that can be somebody in town. There, there's, there wasn't a distance requirement. Going forward, though, um, we're reverting back to the original rule. And the original rule is uh, an employer representative needs to see those original documents in their hand uh, in order to complete the I-9 100% of the time. Okay, here we go. Let's start doing the deep dive. What does it mean to be an employer representative? Does it need to be a full-time employee of your company? Well, let's let's... We'll come right back to that because I think we're going to spend a bunch of time on that. But let's just talk for just a minute on for those who are going to be now uh, completing their I-9s that they use the flexibility rules on, what exactly do, do you have to do? And so once you get your arms around how many uh, forms you use these rules on, what you have to do, it, hopefully you noted on, on the form that the instructions, like I said, were not excellent. But it said you had to note that the delay in seeing the original documents was due to COVID-19. Hopefully that's a note on your form. If it's not, it's not the end of the world. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to um, actually see the documents. And when you do that, you have to note on the, um, on the form itself that an original inspection was done and the date in which it was done. 
And so for timing purposes, because I think most people know that uh, I-9s need to be completed at least within three days of employment beginning. I recommend something different. We'll talk about it. Um, But that's the deadline. So for auditing purposes, they're going to use that date to determine whether or not um, you completed it timely. So the date either earlier of August 30th, 2023, or when the person uh, came back to work, if that's what happened, uh, came back and worked um, in in person. So that's what you have to do. You you have to view the original documents and then you have to note it right on the original I-9 form. And once you do that, then you can store that I-9 uh, with the rest of yours, hopefully never to see the light of day ever again. Okay, quick quick in and out question. I've gotten this question several times over the past year or two. Are I-9 stored in the personnel files or in a separate file just for all the I-9s at the company? I prefer to uh, have them stored separately. And so oh. most now are, are uh, storing them electronically. Yep. And that's entirely fine. A, a, a PDF scan of, of a completed I-9 is absolutely fine. And then uh, stored together, separate from the personnel file, uh, I think is the best practice. Okay, awesome. All right, that was just a little freebie for all of our friends out there. All right, (laughs) (laughs) nothing to do with the exact topic this morning. Okay, can can we get to the question? You bet. Okay, what the way I asked it at first because I was kind of uh, hinting at the answer, right? Is what does it mean to be a representative of the employer who's reviewing? the documents, i.e. what do we do for employees that we never plan on actually meeting in person? Right. So the upside to that is an employer representative can be anyone. Really, it can be anyone. We as the employer can designate anyone to complete the I-9 on our behalf. That's the upside. The downside is we, the employer, are stuck with whatever that person does with, with the I-9 form. So if they if they don't do it right, or if they make, this is not likely, but if they made some intentional a misrepresentation on the document or otherwise screwed it up, um, the fact is we are we are stuck with that. Now there are things we can do to guard against that, but but that's the uh that's the rub uh, on that whole thing. So you know, this remote completion of the I-9 is not a new problem. It's just a much, much bigger problem than, than it was in, in the past. And so here's what I think we ought to be doing. We can designate and should designate anyone who we think we can be trusted with uh, completing that form for us. And the the anxiety that anybody has when we talk to people about actually doing it on our behalf is they, they feel like they are um, making some representations or otherwise committing themselves to some um, process or uh, are otherwise putting themselves out there uh, by doing this. And the reality is that that's not true. The only thing that somebody who signs a 99, whether that's HR or the employer or some third party who's doing it for us, the only thing that uh, the person is committing to is that they actually reviewed the original documents in person and the documents tend to uh, at least appear to apply to the person who is presenting them. That's it. Uh, They're not- They don't need to be an expert on forgery- Right. N- not, not whether the document actually is real, not okay. whether the person is who they say that they are, but rather just that the document is what it appears to be. And it uh, essentially appears to apply to the person who is who is presenting it. So it's not a it's not a heavy lift and it's not a big ask to have somebody do that. What a lot of employers over the years, what, what we have uh, sent employers to do is to try to get um, remote employees uh, connected with notaries around the country, they ah, tend to be answer. tended to be yeah a, a person who you know they don't have any necessarily any special skills or abilities, but it just seemed to be the right type of person who's used to completing form, looking at documents, right, uh, looking at identify identification documents and, and filling out a form, and so that that was really easy and kind of straightforward, and you can find notaries at any uh, bank branch. Um, virtually in the in the country. 
So that is then the answer. Let's just say we have it people an us all over the country. But if we have an employer in Michigan uh, who hires an employee who lives in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, who never plans on coming to Michigan, and it really seems silly to pay for travel, to pay someone to travel from Michigan to Omaha, right. to look at some documents, the HR folks can instruct that new hire to find a notary, right? Review the document and fill out the I-9 form. Right. Now that worked for worked really right. well for, for a while, but yes. we started to catch wind that um, notary associations had been advising their members to not do this for us. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure why. My guess is it's some misunderstanding uh, of what it is exactly that we're asking them to do. Uh, but uh, we, we've run into a number of times where uh, a person has had a hard time tracking down a notary uh, to complete their I-9. And so when that is the case, <clears throat> we can fall back to the, the second position, which is, any adult can do this for us. And so that could, can that be another employee? Absolutely. It can be a roommate. It could be a spouse, can't be a child. Um, it, but it can be literally anyone. Again, the really? rest, we're, yeah, we're just stuck with whatever it is that they do. And so I prefer to use that as the backup position, right? Yeah. Um, that we'll find that we'll be willing to use someone unaffiliated or otherwise maybe uh, has some relationship with, with the new employee. And, uh, but if we, if we need to, we, we can do that. Now, if that's the, going to be the case, what we're going to want to do is have clear instructions to the individual on what it is they need to do. It, and I yeah. want to do that. There, there are two good ways to do that, I think. One is, uh, and we've created uh, sort of a list of uh, sort of a flow chart of exactly what it is we're asking you to do, and it's down in writing, and, and you can provide that to uh, the individual so that so that they can do it. Perfect. That that's easy enough. Yeah. The other way to do it <clears throat> is that you could get on a a Zoom call just like this and do it with them live, so you could literally sort of. Uh, take them through it step by step as it, it's happening. They're the ones signing. They're the ones seeing the original documents, right? But you can see them live and, and you can get it done because what's, if we're going to do this uh, on a remote basis go, going forward, um, there are two things that are critically important that that you get done. One is that you get the um, original I-9 back uh, by mail from the from the new employee. Okay. And then secondly, when you get it back, you review it very carefully uh, as soon as it lands on, on your desk so that you can determine whether or not it was completed properly. Now, if you're doing it live like this uh, and you can actually see what, what they're doing, you're going to be pretty confident that, it, that it's done uh, properly, but I'd still review it. If, if you're doing it with a set of instructions, you, you can't be as confident. Um, so I would uh, I, I would make a point of it to have somebody who knows what they're doing take a look at that I nine uh, thoroughly wh when it lands back at home base. That is incredibly helpful, Mike. You just earned your you just earned your money with that one. Oh, we're doing this free, right? Yes. Well, that's about all I'm worth. <laughs> well, people just got their money's worth with right. that <laughs> right. advice for sure. Um, let's talk about the timing of it. Because sometimes yeah. that three-day period just seems such like an arbitrary short period. What if someone uh, maybe is remote at the moment? In other words, they aren't nearby at the moment, but they're going to be moving here for work, and we've given them, given them, let's say, a month or two uh, to you move bet. here. <clears throat> you Can't bet. We wait. Can't we just wait till they get here and deal with it then? Why? why how important is that three-day yeah. window? That's a great question because that happens so often now. So I'll, I'll start with my, uh, well, here, here's the rule. Um, the rule is that the window for completing an I-9 is after job offer has been made until three days after employment has began. So there can be a pretty decent window there to get that I-9 done. We can't do it during the interview process, of course. 
Um, but as soon as a job offer is made and they accept it, we can do it anytime after, after that, okay. uh, up till three days after employment begins. So there's your window. I recommend getting the I-9 completed before uh, employment begins. Yeah. Your finance people will appreciate it because if there is a problem with the I-9 and um, it looks like we're not going to be able to uh, to continue to employ the person, we still do have to pay them for any time that they spent working for us. And that can be a problem and uh, you'll have your uh, finance and payroll people uh, in your office uh, demanding to know what the heck happened. Um, so I, I think the goal should be before employment begins. Okay. Before employment begins is best practice. Got it. Right. Then, but your question is the exact right one because it's it's the one we get. Look, the person is coming. They're just not coming until next week, next month, something something like that. Right. Should The, the rule says you can't wait, but I would wait. Um, I, I am perfectly, <laughs> that's right. I'm mostly a rule follower. You are uh, such a rebel. I, I know, had no idea. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> An I-9 rebel. Man, that is, that is lame. That's going um, on the stone. That is pretty lame. Um, no, <clears throat> look, I-9s are relatively straightforward forms. Employers have problems with them because they don't get the attention that they that they need. As part of the onboarding process, we have a, a dozen or more things to do, primarily related to getting the person up in our system and being able to being paid, right? And the I-9 doesn't have anything to do with that. And so I-9s get sort of short shrift in, in the whole onboarding process, which I completely understand. That's why we continue to have problems. But on this issue... When the Department of Labor or the Department of Homeland Security is auditing I-9s, they are looking for big problems. They are not looking for small problems. One and off. So what they, they aren't looking for the one off where someone nope, started or nope. came, came in person maybe a month late for a meeting or something. Okay. Exactly right. Yeah. I-9s are the one, maybe there are others. It's the one area of the law that I'm aware of where we get credit for trying. And so <laughs> it's true. We get that's a participation true. award. We we the yeah, the award is we don't get a fine. So that's, that's kind fantastic. of fantastic. I'm yeah. calling it a participation award. For, you for, bet. For if, if we about try to do it right, yeah, that's, that's right. Fantastic. If we try to do it right, we are going to get credit for that. And so, again, I I'm not recommending or suggesting a pattern of filling these out whenever a person happens to come by at the. Christmas party or the annual meeting or something like that. But rather, if you have a situation where you know somebody's going to be there in a week or a month, um, can you wait to to do it on a one-off basis? I, I think the answer to that is clearly yes. Now, what we're going to do if, if we do that is we're going to fill that I-9 form out accurately because we're never going to misrepresent anything in, in an I-9, right? So it's going to say the date that it was filled out, and it's going to say the date employment began, which is going to be more than three days earlier. And so have we We have then documented our substantive I-9 violation. And I am completely and totally okay with that. <laughs> We're going to document our violations. And just to repeat, because people will love that. So, and they might get excited about it and forget about what you said first, which is this is the exception. Yeah, you bet. This is to be used on you exception bet. basis. This is not the rule or the process that your organizations Correct. should adopt. And yeah. so if you ever get in trouble for having done this, this video will be available on YouTube. You can go back, <laughs> pull it up and say, this guy told me I could, and you can send yes. the Department of Labor to see me, um, and I will be happy to handle that for you. But it's never going to happen. Um, if, if this is if this is the biggest problem with your I-9s, it is never going to happen. But the key is, and this is important, um, we are never going to misrepresent anything on an I-9, right? right. We're, we're never going to do that. There is a, uh, a story, a, a sort of a famous story among I-9 nerds here in yeah. West Michigan uh, of an employer. Wait, there's a club for that? There, yeah, it's, it, it's really, I-9 really nerds. small. <laughs> yeah, it, it's really small. Um, <laughs> I'm the president, the treasurer, the secretary. Um, yeah, I have a lot of roles in that club. In any event, <laughs> an employer in West Michigan was audited for, for their I-9s. And um, at, 
as it turned out, this employer did not have I-9s for any of its employees. So what uh, what they did was they quick hurried up and, and ginned them all up and got them and presented them to the Department of Labor as though these were their I-9s. And they backdated them and, and, and did all of that. That person who was responsible for doing that actually went to jail, um, which is the only situation where I'm aware of that anybody ever went to jail over an I-9 issue. And the reason that they were figured out so easily was they used a version of the I-9 form that didn't exist at the time they claimed they were being signed and, and filled out. And so um, that that's, that's a true, unfortunately, a true story uh, here in town and um, you know, identify or at least highlights the risk that uh, you run when you try to do those things. We can deal with virtually any problem in, in an I-9. If we're trying, we can deal with any problem. If we're not trying, if we're sort of blowing off our obligation here, we can deal with most of those problems too. Um, th this is a type of situation where employers sort of get one free strike, meaning okay. if your I-9s are a mess, and you don't realize that until you're audited, um, the Department of Labor, Department of Homeland Security mostly, uh, will work with you to sort of get them uh, in the shape that they need to be in and will be fairly reasonable in my experience uh, about that. Um, but once you take that strike, then you need to have your house in order going forward for 10 years. All right. So... Mike, these uh, off-the-clock episodes are normally 20 to 30 minutes. Yeah. You told me you could talk about I-9s <laughs> all day long. I will admit I did not believe you. <laughs> <laughs> here we are, and we, yeah, haven't even we, gotten, are. we haven't even gotten to our viewer questions. So let's, yeah, let's do that. Can we do rapid fire on these? You bet. Let's go. All right. Let's do it. Let's get it in and out and get people back to work. Okay. Let's talk about uh, the E-word, E-Verify. Right. If our company uses E-Verify, is, is it okay to only view identification documents virtually? Is there an exception for E-Verify, Mike? Th there is not. So the I-9 the I nine obligations are separate from E-Verify. So if you happen to use E-Verify, you, you have to do both. And if you use the, the flexibility rules, you have to go back. And uh, even though you E-Verified the person, you have to go back and um, fill out the I-9 form completely. Perfect. And by the way, I'm in reading glasses now. What do you think? I'm, I'm aging. <laughs> I think you look great. I have I, new glasses and I can barely see anything because I haven't figured them out yet. And I didn't <laughs> want to do this the whole time. When we started doing this webinar series, I did not need reading glasses and now I need reading glasses. So that tells you both how old I am and how long we've been doing this. Okay, next rapid fire question. If the employee is providing different documents than what was provided for uh, verification during the pandemic, do we need to record that information on the I-9 form to be in compliance? Yes, it is okay to present different documents for this part of the process. You don't have to actually see the uh, same documents that you, you use. You have to see documents that are sufficient for uh, completing the, uh, the I-9. I think one of the other questions was, well, what if uh, in the interim uh, the document expired? Do yeah. what? What do we have to see there? And you have to see, you have to see, uh, authentic, valid documents now. So if they presented a passport and it happened to expire, you want to see either renewed passport or different documents. Uh, that that will work. So the idea is then again for a non I nine nerd, I confess. Uh, You're a different type of nerd. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> if, if you saw documents virtually. Uh, early on in the pandemic, the goal now is not to verify the documents you saw three years ago. It's to verify the documents as they stand today, right? I mean, that, that, that's right. So in the huge majority of cases, you're getting driver's license and social security card, right? You're getting that in 90% of, of, of the cases. In 7% more, you're getting a U.S. passport. It's just those last three that, that can be some of these one-off type uh, documents that you don't see all of the time. And so you're probably going to see those again, and it's it's fine if uh, they had expired in the meantime, but we do yeah. need valid documents now. Or names change, right? People get divorced, you bet. People get married, like things change. So it's not, we're not trying to validate what we saw three years ago and prove that that document exists as it did three years ago. We're doing it almost as if the new, the new it's a new. Yeah, a bit of both, but yeah. Yeah, okay, let's go 
one more, uh, and this one is a is a real specific one. So this is a gift to whoever asked it for taking the time to type in this very specific question. Mike is going to answer it for you. A new hire presented his U.S. passport uh, card to complete his I-9 when we submitted his form 1095-C. This is why I am not an I-9 nerd. Uh, <laughs> can't say it. To the IRS, it got rejected because of a mismatched name. Come to find out his passport is missing part of his given name. How do we correct his name on his I-9? We proceeded to update his name using the name he had on a social security card and in his payroll. Mismatched names, Mike. Right. Oh. So <clears throat> all of that, um, just take this. This is the answer is for everyone, actually. Whenever we make a correction on an I-9, all we want to do is note it and highlight it and make sure we're acknowledging that it's happening now and it was, we didn't get it right the first time. So in that situation where we got the name wrong or if it was anything else, what, what I would do is input on the form the correct name and then date and initial the change and that's it. And you can do that for uh, virtually any uh, correction or change that, that you make to, to an I-9, again, we just want to make sure we're making it clear that we're doing it today, June 7th, and we didn't get it right January 1st or whenever that was. Excellent. So then lastly, I know there was one other one, but it, but it's an important one. Somebody asked, what do we do about um, updating driver's licenses that that expire? And right. so that's a re-verification issue. And here's what I want you to take away from that. We do not re-verify driver's licenses. Right. If you get a driver's license and a social security card from somebody, you complete that form, you do it uh, thoroughly, you do it right, and you put that I-9 away and you never look at it again. We only re-verify documents, it, employment authorization documents that have an expiration date. Right. Yeah. So a driver's license is an identification document, so we don't worry about that. Yeah. A U.S. passport is an identification document and an employment authorization document. So we don't worry about that. Okay. Um, a social security card is the employment authorization document, but it doesn't have an expiration date, right? So right. we don't ever worry about those again. There's a limited number of times that you're going to run into that somebody has employment authorization in the United States that expires. It's either going to be in a visa type situation, an employment authorization document actually is a thing um, that'll have an expiration date on it. Okay. Those are the things that, that we re-verify. If somebody is a lawful permanent resident, they give you their lawful permanent resident card or green card. We don't worry about that, that either because that is a list A identity and uh, employment authorization document. We only re-verify employment authorization documents that that expire. So driver's license is a long way of answering driver's license, fill it out and forget it. <laughs> Mike, quick in and out answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Look, <laughs> this, this is, is as quick as an I-9 answer can be is what I've This learned. is all that super is complicated. This is why I were able to have our society of I-9 nerds. <laughs> right? hey, the I-9 form, hold on. The I-9 form is two pages long. Yeah. And the instructions to fill it out are 89 pages. <laughs> and and most story. employers, and I know we're over time, so we're going to say goodbye in a minute, but yep. let's just say what everyone's thinking right now that's watching and listening. Who gets this job at most uh, employers, at most companies? Who's doing this, right? Most likely entry level. Most likely entry HR level um, folks or uh, HR folks, right? Yeah. Uh, you right. Know, folks who get tasked with, with, the, with the onboarding. Um, yeah. And we wonder why there's mistakes with I-9s, right? You why bet have trouble because it is this is one of those things that's way more complicated than it first appears if you think you have a problem or if you haven't looked at it in a while take a look at a sample of them and see what kind of shape they're in if they're in great shape great if they're not then maybe give us a call and uh we can talk through uh what it is you might be facing and see if we can't get you back on the path to uh living a good life and being i9 compliant <laughs> living a good life because you are i9 compliant maybe yes. That's what is I said. Is that one of the definitions? Uh, it is to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us live this morning, Mike. This was just awesome. And we're so you lucky bet. to have you here as a resource. Glad to do it. Have a great day, everyone.